Thank you everyone for the invite. I'm honored to present on Sylvia Dengi from Emergency Department to ICU Care. Um, sorry. This is my disclaimer. Um, I'm basically presenting on behalf of the Dengi uh, webinar series by my ICID. So, um, so what do we know? So what do we know about dengue um, infection? So some of the basic facts, as we know, it's a um, three-phase um, disease where there's a febrile phase, there's a critical phase, and the reabsorption phase. Febrile phase typically lasts about one to about four days or less than that. And critical phase typically lasts for about 48 hours. And the recovery phase follows shortly the critical phase where the patient actually starts getting better. Some of the complications that we generally see during this time, during the febrile phase, um, very often than not, patients can present with some dehydration. Um, they can present with some CNS impairment, some, some mild organ impairment with some acute confusional state, which is very self-limiting. And, uh, and uh, during this time, um, uh, blood test results have done very early. We not show anything, by, but by the second or the third day, we can start seeing uh, platelets coming down. And, uh, and uh, during this time, the hematocrit must still be uh, stable, but if they have any signs of um, um, a dengue with warning signs, then they will go ahead and develop uh, a hemoconcentration, uh, right? Uh, just bring in my pointer, okay? And um, during this time, uh, viremia is also very high, peak viremia at this point, and, and most of the diagnosis is basically made by some blood tests, uh, and it's one antigen, and some blood tests, which basically picks up uh, patients early during the febrile phase. Critical phase lasts for about 48 hours. During this time, they may or may not be any more fever. Patients generally present with, um, with um, they can, patients may be asymptomatic during the critical phase, but the ones with um, warning signs, they can go on to develop some pretty critical organ impairment over here. They can start developing shock, bleeding, uh, plasma leakage during this time. Uh, hemoconcentration can start happening. And during this time, platelet will start dropping further with a further drop in white cell count. And, uh, and towards the end of critical phase, those start picking up. And um, uh, patients uh, during the critical phase, they typically last for about 48 hours. It hasn't been longer than that. But if they have other... Uh, immune uh, um, activation uh, like HLH or hyperstimulation syndrome or cytokine storms, sometimes the critical phase can actually be prolonged. During the recovery phase reabsorption, generally what happens is we can start seeing platelets recovering during this time. White cell count recovers first before the platelet starts recovering and uh, will soon normalize. Now, this is more of like a payback period. So if we have been sort of um, um, are not um, very judicious with our fluids, then we'll start seeing uh, fluid absorption because there'll be uh, fluid uh, overload because there'll be quite a bit of reabsorption during this time. And, um, and uh, dengue IgM will start going up by day seven and IgG beyond day 10. And uh, patients with secondary dengue, however, may not have an IgG, uh, IgM uh, uh, response, but the IgG will be those of high titer, and if they present early, the NS1 will still be positive, right? So this is the typical spectrum of the knee infection that we generally see. All we know, and we have learned from before, that it's a very dynamic nature of disease, right? So what you, what you sort of perceive about two hours ago may not really stand. So it's a very dynamic nature. So you need to have timed interventions and time review of the patients to pick up some of these complications that we just briefly talked about. And uh, we talked about the complication of each phases. And of course, we're starting to see, uh, we were starting to see newer complications may not be so new right now. Uh, bleeding and leaking syndrome, where the patients may be bleeding, but of course, leaking at the same time. Typically, patients here will have still very high hematocrit, but um, uh, will be hemodynamically unstable or in compensated shock with very, very high lactates that may not uh, respond to fluid resuscitation, right? And we started we started seeing quite a bit of organ failures, myocarditis, CNS um, abnormalities. Uh, I've seen bleeds, I've seen vasculitis, I've seen cerebral edema, uh, epidural hematomas, uh, liver failures, and of course, a hyperinflammation state um, caused by an overactive immune system uh, due to a dysregulation of our immune system. It's um, uh, more like a secondary form of hemophagocytosis. 
right? And we know what the warning signs are, uh, abdominal pain, persistent vomiting, persistent diarrhea, um, developing ascites, spiral effusion, pericardial effusion, you know, uh, sort of like a leaky, leaky capillaries, right? Spontaneous bleeding tendencies, lethargy, restlessness, confusion, a tender liver, and of course, a very raised hematocrit, the rapid platelet. These are quite significant. Now, before we make the diagnosis of dengue, dengue infections cannot be made from the patient's chart. Uh, dengue, sorry, um, uh, dengue uh, diagnosis or, or, or your, your, your response to your clinical decision cannot be made at the uh, patient's chart or at a computer without actually touching the patient. So we need to actually, um, uh, we need to ascertain the face of illness uh, based on what our knowledge already is, examine clinically uh, to look at the peripheral perfusion per se, and of course, look at the vital signs and only then look at the blood results and come up with a more holistic position. So this is the four cornerstones of dengue. All right. And, uh, and uh, we went through this. And of course, uh, some of the um, uh, complications that we can get, like dehydration and cephalitis, we talked about organ failures, organ dysfunction, bleeding. And of course, sepsis is something that we can expect at every stage. Right. And some of the causes of shock in dengue, volume deficits, bleeding, organ dysfunction, and of course, sepsis, right? So let's look at Mr. JD, um, JD at emergency department, all right? 32-year-old um, male, obese, 100 kgs, um, um, adjusted body weight's about 80 kgs now, presented with fever for three days, um, arthralgia, myalgia, vomiting five times a day, loose stool, no bleeding tendencies, no other symptoms. Clinically, warm peripheries, CRT less than two seconds, about two seconds, sorry, good pulse volume, Lungs were clear. There was no signs of any leakage at the moment. Blood pressure was 130-90, slightly tachycardic at 100. So this was his ABG, uh, sorry, VBG, uh, pH is 7.37, um, bicarb of 23, lactate was 1.5. Hematocrit was high at 49, lactate was still 105 at this point. Uh, white took out 6.6, .6, right? So the impression, dengue fever, day five of illness in febrile phase with warning signs, persistent vomiting, diarrhea, with hemoconcentration concentration and low platelet, not in shock and no leaking and NS1 positive. So <coughs> quite a mouthful of a diagnosis there, right? So the plan was to encourage orally, strict IO chart, continue three cc per kg per hour, and of course, um, um, a timed visit in, uh, as well as um, uh, blood test results now, and trace all the blood test results and uh, given a time to actually take the blood and trace the blood results. Okay. So patient came in at, uh, at, uh, at midnight. Okay, at this point, this was the hematocrit 49. Plate was 127. We know that it was a bit tachycardic. So it was started in lactate to high 3.0. Okay, so it was started on 5 cc per kg. It was started on 5 cc per kg. And then subsequently um, at 3.30 p.m., uh, 3.30 a.m., sorry, um, uh, it responded to the, to the, to the 5 cc per kg, and the hematocrit actually come down, uh, came down significantly, right? So from 49, it actually came down to 45, and then was lingering around there, okay? At this point, platelets started coming down too. The lowest platelet that we saw at about 7 a.m. in the morning was 103. Lactate's definitely normalized, okay? And uh, at 7 a.m., it wasn't detected. But look at the blood, uh, look at the uh, IV drip. Right? So 5 cc per kg, 5 cc per kg, and then some, somehow someone brought it down to 3 cc per kg, and, um, and, then, and then subsequently 3 cc per kg. So the, the intervals of, of assessment here was actually quite, quite um, uh, there was a long lapse in, in, in terms of the medical assessment here. So patient was actually seen at 123, and subsequently, although blood results were timed to be taken, but it wasn't properly traced, and, and not until 7 o'clock, where someone decided to actually cut down the drip to 3 cc per kg. At this point, um, he had very good urine output, 400 cc's. Blood pressure was about the same at that point. Um, blood pressure normalized a little bit to 120, 80. Right. So, what was the impression? Why was the first hematocrit that uh, uh, was high at the same time? Is the patient dehydrated? Is the patient leaking? Is the patient bleeding? Or the patient's leaking and bleeding at the same time? Because he was a little bit tachycardic, right? So, at this point, um, the most logical explanation would be that this guy is still was dehydrated. So, after um, um, a, a good 
bolus, his, his hematocrit came down, right? But it was not necessary for us to continue that high infusion rate all the time because patients showed no signs of compensated shock, blood tests actually normalized. And, and if we had timely seen him, we could have actually brought down the drip or even offed it if the patient was taking orally very well. So some of the frequent pitfalls that we generally see is there's no timed or frequent reviews, which is actually done. So we assume that whatever state or phase of illness he was um, uh, five hours ago will persist even now. So that is one wrong thing that we often do when it comes to uh, reviewing patients with dengue. It is so dynamic that it may change even um, every two hours. So it's important to have some form of um, uh, sort of like a um, uh, uh, rhythm to, to seeing these patients, right? Uh, review every four hourly or even write down when is my re next review time date, you know, uh, uh, time. Uh, so at, at, at seven o'clock, I have to actually see this patient, you know? So not realizing that the initial presentation could be dehydration and leading to high fluid bolus, like this particular case where this gentleman came in with a high hematocrit. Yes, he was given 5 cc per kg, but after achieving what we wanted, where the lactates all came down, the hematocrit came down, the, the, the infusion rate could actually be cut down, but this was not done so in this patient. And of course, not reducing the drip after an outcome was actually achieved. Okay, so, um, so in, a, in, a, in, a, in a huge... Um, um, a ward, you know, dengue ward where you actually see 20, 30 patients, you know, it's difficult. If it's one or two patients, it's okay, you know, it's like 20, 30 patients. It's actually difficult for us to um, remember which patients actually need to be seen, right? So um, in, a, in, a, in a dengue ward, we generally have this, this um, ward, um, this board that basically tells us, okay, this patient, you know, when is the next review time and when is the next blood taking, okay? So it's important to specify the next review time in um, the case notes or in the computer uh, so that they, you know, uh, they, someone remembers now, right? So in a busy emergency department also, when we're giving fluid boluses, right? Sometimes it's difficult to know how much the patients actually get, right? So um, unless you have a, 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 a specified way of actually keeping track, like if you actually put them on an infusion pump and then you can actually be sure that these patients got what they want, sometimes a kinked, um, a branula, a, a line which is not running, you know, may actually account for, we may actually think the patient's getting 5 cc per kg or 200 cc of fluid, but they may not be actually getting it at um, uh, that amount. So um, a, a simple practice like counting amount of IV drip bottles to get an accurate measurement of what actually went in is some of the things that we used to use, all right? And, uh, and, and uh, compared to the, to the, uh, all the CPG, you know, if, if you look at the uh, uh, practice guideline 2015, there was a good emphasis on oral fluid intake. IV fluid therapy only indicated certain, um, uh, certain groups, easier calculation of the maintenance fluid. And of course, there was a stress on adjusted body weight in obese patients because a lot of people uh, felt that we had to account for the body mass and, and, uh, and, uh, and the actual amount of fluid that was actually needed. So the same patient came up, J.D. Edward. So um, day four of admission, okay. Um, sorry. So day four of admission, uh, uh, day four of uh, illness, sorry. Day four of illness, 7 a.m. As we know, platelet was 103. Hematocrit was 45 at that point. Uh, lactate all came down. So this is the lactate. This is the hematocrit. It's, um, so when we reviewed him at 7 a.m., we realized he was on a big positive balance. So we decided to, okay, lah. I cut down the uh, 3 cc to 1.5 uh, cc per kg. He was still a bit tachycardic, so we were worried about taking off the drip. And, and subsequently, he was maintained on a 1.5 cc per kg. Okay? However, his fluid intake, uh, oral intake was actually very good. Okay? Hemodynamically, became no more tachycardic. Still, a high infusion, uh, you know, uh, 1.5 cc per kg was actually continued. So during this time, as you can see, slowly the hematocrit started going up. Okay, so about 24 hours of admission, you can see that the platelet started plummeting. Okay, there's a rise in hematocrit. Okay, and there's also rise in the lactate. So when the patient was actually reviewed at this time, they noted he was a bit more tachycardic. Uh, blood pressure was about 110 over 79. There was no documentation of what the peripheries were, but there was already a reduced 
uh, right base. At this point, because of the infusion that he was actually given, it was almost about three liters positive balance, okay? Urine output was decent, okay? It was not, uh, sorry, urine output was not documented at that point, right? And then subsequently, um, um, uh, when we saw that the hematocrit went up, we thought, okay, he needs more drip, he's starting to leak, he needs more drip. So the infusion was actually increased to three cc per kg. We were worried about giving any, um, any um, although he was tachycardic, you know, um, and there is slight narrowing of the pulse pressure here, he was not given a bolus because he was already three liters positive balance, all right? So at um, after 11 p.m. bloods, the next blood was actually at 6 a.m. in the morning. At this point, the hematocrit was very high. It was a 55. Platelet um, uh, plummeted even more. ALT, ASD was significant. It was three times more, three to four times more elevated. Here, the lactate actually went up to 4.7, and uh, this patient was still on three cc per kg, so from 11 p.m. up to about 6 a.m. Patients continued on three cc per kg, all right? And uh, urine output was documented as times one. At this point, uh, blood pressure was 11080, still narrow. There was still reduction in the in the right base, and it was still a bit tachycardic, although less. Okay. So this is why you say. So we ideally, ideally, what should have happened is when the patient first came and his um, hematocrit was corrected, should have reduced down the drip to a very bare minimum or even offed it if the patient was taking orally well. So by the time 24 hours later, when he actually went into critical phase, he did not have such a big positive balance at that point, all right? But however, when we really need to actually give him a fluid, we are reluctant to do so because the patient may be, the, the patient may have ascites, have her pleural fusion like this, this particular patient, you know? So what we do is we gradually increase the drip, 3 cc per kg, okay, not working, then 5 cc per kg, okay, not working, then 7 cc per kg. But this patient <clears throat> is continuously leaking and is actually intravascular volume depleted. So even if this patient is overloaded, but he's smack in the middle of critical phase, and his intravascular volume is low, this patient needs to get that seven, five to seven cc per kg of fluid that he should be getting. Right, because intravascular volume is depleted, and if we, we don't replenish that, he'll continue to <clears throat> leak. Right, so this is what I meant by initially it was actually okay, and then it actually started narrowing around this point here. Yeah? So, this is what um, uh, narrowing of pulse pressure looks like. So, in a non shock dengue patient, if a patient without comorbidities can actually tolerate orally, adequate fluid intake, two to three liters, should be encouraged. So, if you don't need to give them, if they're taking orally well, do not give any fluids. All right. Inappropriate intravenous fluid therapy can actually prolong hospitalization and, and can contribute towards the overload, especially during the time when you actually need um, uh, to give the patient. So, we, we all agree that this patient is a compensated shock. Was used and uh, pulse rate was very high. You know, everything fits, right? Pulse rate was very high. Uh, of course, peripheries were not documented, but hematocrit was high, lactate went up to four. So, this patient significantly, okay, um, uh, fitted all the, all the uh, parameters in compensated shock. He also had a narrowing of uh, pulse pressure, right? So he was entering critical phase during that time. So what is, what is a critical phase? So what is the best mark of critical phase? A lot of people have asked us before, what is the best mark of critical phase? So drop in platelet, increase in hematocrit is one of the best markers of critical phase. Sometimes if you don't see <clears throat> white cell count, the lowest white cell count during that time with lymphocytosis and an increase in liver enzymes can happen during critical phase, can give you sort of like a, uh, a picture when critical phase sort of started, right? Or if everything else fails, critical phase often occurs after the third day of fever, may occur earlier or around the defervescence period indicated by a rapid drop in temperature. Normally, this coincides with increase in capillary permeability and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and patients start uh, developing complications during this time. Why is it important? It's very important because we need to ride the storm during that time, right? So going back to our patient, so it was hematocrit was 55, platelet was 20, had a bit of hepatitis, worsening hepatitis, sorry. Bicarb was 18, lactate was 4.7. This is when we panicked. So from three cc per kg, we gave him 10 cc per kg, all right? Right thing to do, we gave him that, all right? And patient improved. <clears throat> Blood pressure from narrowed became better, 120, 80. 
tachycardia improved slightly. He was uh, 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 lactic reduced from 4.7, went down to 3. My cup was about 19. Hematocrit went down also 55 to 49. Okay. And um, um, uh, um, um, at this point, uh, warmer peripheries was documented. He was warmer peripheries and reduced air entry, right? Now, because we had given him quite a bit of fluids even before he entered critical phase, he was already four liters per step balance. And this actually somebody had put in a, a CBD at this point. So urine output was about 80 cc per hour. Okay. So <clears throat> at this point, all right, um, uh, uh, clinically, peripheries were actually cool. Uh, uh, CRT prolonged, you know, they put in a CBD, it's about 300 cc's, sorry, uh, CBD inserted, so about 300 cc's, this is a residual rear end, and, uh, and uh, he was actually given the 10 cc per kg, as, as shown here on the table, and with that 10 cc per kg, he really responded, right? But because he was so positive balance, he was, the drips were actually reduced back to 3 cc per kg, and then to 2 cc per kg, as, as, um, as, as the patient was already uh, uh, four liters positive balance. Okay, there, um, and, um, and during this time, yeah, I responded, but he rebounded back again. At this point, lactate did come from 4.7 to three, but <clears throat> four, three hours later, a repeated blood test actually showed the lactate was worsening again from three, it went up to 3.5, acidosis worsened, and, um, and our platelet was down some more. Hematocrit about the same, 49 went up to 50. Uh, urine output is about 50 cc per hour for about two hours or so. Warm, good uh, CRT is about two seconds. You know, pulse rate seems to be good volume, but still a bit tachycardic, all right? And he started becoming a bit tachypnic by then, all right? So after the specialist actually saw the patient at uh, at, uh, with a hematocrit of 50, no, not really, not really budging much with a hematocrit of 50. As you know, his baseline hematocrit was about 44 to 45, right? So this is hemoconcentration. And he is obviously not um, well yet, right? After a review by a specialist given 7 cc per kg and 5 cc per kg of uh, uh, one hour um, of colloids, okay, is persistent high hematocrit with an increasing lactate. Repeated hematocrit was 40. This is a rapid drop from 50 to 40. HB was 14, platelet was 15. Lactate did not budge much. Lactate was still three. Bicarb was 18. But blood pressure was better and, and, and uh, tachycardia was about the same. Okay, so what do we think which is actually going on at the moment? All right, so some of the pitfalls that we see was fluids were cut down too fast. All right, because this patient, we achieved what we wanted, the hematocrit came down. But because he had such a big positive balance, we cut down the, the, the dip immediately. But the capillary leakage is still ongoing, all right? Whatever bleeding or leaking, whatever that's happening at that point is still ongoing. So by cutting down the, 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 the drip so fast, we are not plugging the holes of, of which, which are leaking in the capillaries, you know, we're not plugging the holes properly, you know, we're pulling back too fast, right? So we did not recognize that this patient was still requiring, uh, was still leaking <clears throat> and requires more fluid, you know, so we cut down the fluid too fast. And of course, um, uh, we, it's important for us to time the use of colloid at the right time, all right? So how to use a colloid? So unmask a bleed for decompensated shock because it, uh, it restores the cardiac indexes faster and reduces the hematocrit. High hematocrit with massive positive balance and poor reserve. Sometimes what happens is in a saline drip, the, 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 the leak, the molecules are much smaller. So sometimes whatever you give just passes out, okay? So during this point, in order to retain the fluid in the intravascular space, Sometimes we use a colloid, the colloid by anything, it could be albumin, it could be uh, a gelafin fundin, you know, uh, gelafundin. Uh, um, some people use albumin or gelafin, right? Okay, so colloid should not be used as a prolonged infusion, okay? Um, because it can actually cause some coagulopathy, 
Um, it can cause fluid overload, renal impairment, uh, and, and of course, uh, patients with li uh, severe liver dysfunction can start developing a bit multi organ failure and coagulopathy if we continue, if we use colloids at a, at a, at a prolonged infusion, right? So uh, <clears throat> basically here, fluid management, so compensated shock, we give fluid resuscitation with isotonic crystalloid uh, saline, okay? Five to 10 mils per hour. If they improve after one hour of giving, repeat the hematocrit. Okay, another case, another uh, sort of like pitfall in this case is the hematocrit estimations actually were, were very spaced out. So we didn't really know whatever infusion um, uh, infusion or boluses that we were giving uh, was working or not, right? So it's important to have a pre-bolus blood and a one hour later post-bolus blood, right? So if the patient here, after giving the bolus, if the patient improves, okay. If the patient does not improve, then you actually check the hematocrit. Okay. And what are the parameters that you actually look for? You look for improvement in well-being, warm peripheries, capillary refill time, is the PP stable, is pulse pressure better, is, is tachycardia reducing, is it good urine output, is the patient less to kidney? And of course, we need appropriate <clears throat> uh, estimation of the hematocrit response, as well as to see whether metabolic acidosis is improving or the lactate is reducing or not. Right. So if the patient is improving, yes, and you slowly cut it down. One to two hours, you slowly cut it down. So if you start with five to seven mils per kg, then you reduce it three to five mils, and then you reduce it to two to three mils, and you continue to reduce it over a period of four to six hours and, and with frequent estimation of hematocrit, especially if the patient was very, uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, unwell to start off with. Right? If the patient is not stable, then you have to act according to the hematocrit level. If the hematocrit doesn't come down, then you may need to give a, a, another fluid bolus or consider a colloid as a, as, a, as a replacement fluid, right? If the hematocrit comes down, but the patient's not stable, then consider transfusion with PAC cells as the, the patient's hematocrit is inappropriately low, but patient is actually unstable, all right? Okay, so um, check the hematocrit. If the hematocrit is low and the patient's unstable, consider uh, uh, platelets, uh, sorry, uh, consider uh, pack cell uh, transfusion, okay? If the hematocrit high, you either give a second bolus, uh, either with a colloid or, or, um, or, uh, or with a crystalloid, depending on how much positive balance that you already have, okay? So in our Mr. JD's case, all right, was bleeding, as hematocrit dropped and you were still unstable with tachycardia, um, uh, lower limit of normal in urine output, and the lactate was high. Okay, so it was bleeding. Uh, who are high risk bleeders? They have prolonged shock, they have refractory shock, they have hypotensive shock um, uh, or renal or liver failures. Those with persistent metabolic acidosis are given non NSAIDs, those who have pre existing peptic ulcer disease, those who are on anticoagulant therapy with any form of trauma, including intramuscular injections. Right? Not so silent bleeder, of course, we always have these patients who are coming in late. So uh, just to summarize, case one, day four of illness, compensated shock, decompensated shock, serum lactate is five, hematocrit is 43, platelets only 5,000, liver is impaired, all right? Thought process is considered bleeding as the hematocrit is inappropriately low in, in, a, in an unstable patient. Second case is day four of illness, decompensated shock, uh, serum lactate is five, hematocrit is 50, pill is 5,000, so, so impaired, impaired liver as well, right? So this patient, you probably need to give up fluid bolus, all right? Uh, fluid bolus first, because patient's probably also leaking at the same time, all right? And get blood on, trans, uh, on standby um, uh, while we are, we, are, we, are, we are giving the fluid boluses. And after you give the fluid bolus, Make sure, check the, the, the hematocrit again, right? Of course, the underlying comorbidities can also make things more, um, more uh, confusing. So in decompensated shock, it is advisable to actually start off upfront with colloid because it restores cardiac index better. Hematocrit comes down even faster, faster for us to actually uh, identify patients who are are improving or not. So if they are improving, yes or no. So no improvement after the 10 to 20 mils split, you look at the hematocrit. Hematocrit is high, means to give a second bolus. Hematocrit is low, transfuse blood.
if the patient improved, um, if the patient improved, then slowly cut down the leash. Okay, if the patient shows no improvement, again, go through the same scenario of uh, uh, guided by our hematocrit. If the hematocrit goes down again, of course, consider bleeding at this point. Yeah. All right. When it's not about fluids, all right, there's always some patients in where the intravascular volume is actually quite good. Okay, is 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 well maintained. So peripheries are warm, or 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 uh, 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 CRT is good, you know, or you've given multiple boluses, but whatever problem that you're dealing with is actually not improving, right? So it's time to actually consider other causes of shock. Septic shock, you will have warm dilated peripheries may need to, you know, white scalp may be high, patient may be spiking temperature, may be thinking of some, some community quite and most common infection. Patients who are leaking and bleeding at the same time, these are the patients where you will have high hematocrit, <clears throat> high, uh, high-ish hematocrit, uh, you will have very high lactate, you give fluids also, hematocrit might still come down, the same, but lactate will be persistently high. So these are the patients we might be thinking of leaking and bleeding at the same time, right? Cardiac dysfunction, you'll have patients who are sort of um, 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 uh, shut down in the peripheries, all right? Hematocrit may never be high, but their blood pressure might be low. Lactates may just linger about two to three like that, okay? In these patients, of course, the lactate is very, very high, may consider blood transfusion, but these patients generally need to think whether there is cardiac dysfunction, so myocarditis going on, so they need a quick, um, a quick echo or a drop eye estimation uh, for us to see whether this patient will actually benefit from low dose of inotropes or not. And of course, um, uh, patients with uh, um, multi organ failure, we need to shift our thinking to organ failure management. And of course, in patients with cytokine storm, these are patients who have stable hematocrit, worsening markers of uh, hemophagocytic uh, syndrome. These are generally normally CNS and liver, and sometimes even all the organs will be involved, including multi-organ failures, right? Of course, if think normal and iron gap acidosis due to too much saline always, especially if patients have um, hypochloremic metabolic acidosis, think about starvation uh, uh, ketosis in patients with normal lactate, normal sugar acidosis, think normal and iron gap acidosis in pregnancy, okay? this probably just need to type through, okay? So let's look at um, a second case. 23-year-old Malay lady admitted to a private hospital day four of illness. Fever never settled, was on Panadol. <clears throat> Transferred to HSB on day eight of illness because of worsening transaminitis, all right? Uh, upon review, alert, tachycardic, good pulse volume, CRT is less than two seconds, warm peripheries, urine output is under CC per hour, and she's got the typical... Dengue rash, right? Lungs showed um, uh, leaking, okay? L uh, right lower zone reduced entry, trepidations bilaterally, and of course, <coughs> in, in large liver, right? This is a blood test. Hematocrit 37, 38, 37, 37. Uh, so when she was admitted, uh, this is the private uh, blood test. So day five of illness, she came in with a hematocrit 37, plate low is 100. And seven, day six of illness, it started going down. Um, uh, and and uh, weird enough, when you're actually supposed to see patients, white cell count getting better and the platelets getting better, you start seeing here, uh, day eight of illness, the white cell count comes down, a platelet comes down, AST just plummets up, you know, continues to worsen up to 2000. INR worsens lactate 5, so everybody panics, so the patient gets transferred, right? At this point, peritin is more than 20,000. CRP is not high. A renal profile is still normal at this point, right? Besides dengue, of course, number one diagnosis is dengue with, with uh, hemophagocytic syndrome or a, or a dysregulated immune response, right? Leading to multi organ failure. But despite that, would there be any other diagnosis? So you have community or quiet sepsis with uh, DIVC. Uh, you can have nosogomial infection. You can have dengue shock with bleeding and leaking that wasn't up earlier. And now you're just paying for all the multi-organ failures, right? So this was the chest x-ray on admission to Sungai Blue. And you can see they actually have some evidence of bilateral um, pleural fusion here going on, right? With, um... So what will you do? 
Uh, are you going to give blood and fluids? Okay, because you know, just a bit tachycardic, left it all high, liver all gone, you know, platelets slowly coming down, hematocrit lowish, 30, but you know, it never really budged, right? Um, dexamethasone, um, uh, antibiotics, or you're going to give methylprednisolone and antibiotics, or you're going to give methylprednisolone or dexamethasone alone. Okay, since it's a webinar, I'll answer my own question. <laughs> okay, so um, impression. Dengue fever with HLH and acute liver injury, basically because there was worse than this patient was not given any fluids in the, in the, in the, in the private center because she was taking oral quite well. So of course, ischemic hepatitis is always the first instance. So this patient was actually given a fluid bolus, 7 cc per kg over one hour and gradually reduced it, all right? And uh, IV dexamethasone, eight milligrams TDS was actually started. She was started on NS dalsystine because INA was actually high and she was admitted for ICU for close dynamic monitoring. These kind of patients should be in an ICU setting, should have an art line so that you can actually see how uh, well perfused they are, you know, uh, whether uh, they are still fluid responsive or not. They need the echo to see whether they are fluid responsive or not. Sometimes what they do is they lift up the patient's leg you know, uh, they lift up the patient's leg uh, up for about 45 degrees, keep it for about two, about close to one to two minutes, and then do an echo to see whether the filling is better or not. So if that's positive, then a straight leg test is positive, then, then most likely this patient will benefit from some fluids, right? And, um, and by day 10 of illness, she was already, so at this point, she was already two days of dexamethasone. She was given some fluids, now maintained on a very low level. Lactates, responded to the fluid resus and responded to the dexamethasone, okay? But LFT was worsening <clears throat> and so was the coagulopathy. At this point, yes, the patient was tachypneic because we were giving fluids and she was worsening. Um, lethargic, GCS was still full, but BB was unsupported at this point, all right? Um, AST worsened from 2000, went up to 2,638. ALT worsened, total bilirubin also worsened. A ferritin was up to 40,000, LDH was 10,000, lactate was 4.5, and one point INA even failed, right? So it was actually looking like we were losing the gun. So what did we do? We upgraded antibiotics, okay? Obviously, rosepin went up to the sin. We, we are standing orders, KIV for antifungal if the blood pressure drops, off the DEXA, and we switched to methylprednisone, 500 milligrams. So when that methylpred was started, um, slowly the AST started coming down, okay? Don't know whether it was a delayed um, effect from dexamethasone or whether it's methylprednisone working suddenly, working very well, not sure, but whatever it is, the AST started coming down, all right? And uh, uh, the LDH also started improving. Of course, ferritin is still fine. Okay, by day 13, however, so these are the you know, after COVID, we all know these are the side effects of giving a lot of um, a lot of um, uh, steroids. Um, patient developed tons of nosocomial sepsis. Okay, we'd be stable, however, never really required any oxygen. Venti mass forty percent, GCS was full. So it started going down, and uh, and the uh, liver function also um, went uh, um, improved very well, and the platelet normalized almost right. She had a stormy state and multiple antibiotics, even fluconazole was given at that point. Blood cultures were all no growth. And, um, and by day 14 or so, she was afebrile, platelets have gone up, ventilation was down to um, nasal prong. Subsequently, she was transferred to ward by day 16 of illness. And after eight days in ICU, she was <clears throat> eventually discharged well, right? So why liver failure? Prolonged shock, ischemic hepatitis is Direct by a uh, cytopathic effect of the virus is a, is a, is another cause. Dysregulated host response, and of course, drug-induced liver injury, and of course, a pre-existing liver damage. Right. So, spectral HLH presence of persistent fever. When you suspect someone actually has dengue uh, induced HLH, secondary uh, HLH from dengue, right? Persistent fever beyond day seven. Patients with multi-organ failure and shock beyond plasma leakage. Those with worsening cytopenias, those with very high ferritin levels, you know, five figure above ferritin levels, and of course, a high triglyceride level and a raised LDH, right? And, uh, and the, the, the three important players are the macrophages, the natural killer cells, and cytotoxic lymphocytes. All of them traditionally, they are, their role is actually to engulf uh, infected cells and to 
and to get rid of the body from, from, from pathogenic cells, right? But all this um, leads up to a dysregulated in, in HLH. All these three players, they become over-activated <clears throat> and they lead to a very dysregulated immune response. In turns, the, that, that cytokine storm actually ends up causing more of a multi-organ failure to our friends, to our, to our patients. Okay, and um, this, is a, this is a study that was actually done uh, um, in Joe's, so it's a collection of four cases, all right? And uh, looking at HS uh, score as a predictor of HLH, all right? Uh, it may still be under-recognized, so HLH obviously may still be under-recognized. <clears throat> if we do bone marrow evidence, definitely, you know, we may find um, uh, evidence of HLH, but with very low platelets and, and uh, so much of coagulopathy, a lot of people might not be very comfortable doing a bone marrow. So more often than not, it's never done. As you can see, we see super high ferritin levels, all right? And, uh, and uh, HS score probability may be low in some patients, but generally um, it, it seems to be the most user-friendly that picks up HH. Of course, it's not a validated score uh, for infection associated with uh, with uh, with um, uh, uh, with, um, uh, yeah, with hemophagocytosis, right? It's not validated for infection, but generally the clinical, clinical judgment is, is what we need to use. So this is a five-year retrospective uh, single center study, basically looking at all those severe dengue uh, were admitted with a tertiary intensive care unit. So they look at, they look at 180 cases and 22% um, and, um, um, and, uh, of these patients actually died. Uh, due to HLH, okay? And at 12% of them um, uh, had a, uh, a defined as an HLH, only 12% of them actually had a HLH uh, probability of more than 70% according to scorings, right? But 43% um, but, um, um, uh, actually died. So we know that it actually has a very high risk of mortality, okay? And the presence of CNS symptoms can um, also also strongly suggest chemophagocytosis, right? And uh, <clears throat> one of the description of, uh, um, of a patient was, patient was peeing on the floor. I couldn't remember me, but you no, know, could not remember when he first met me. Uh, 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 but he knew I, I, I sort of exist, you know, it was disorientated to time, uh, a place and person. This patient was, was red as a chicken, you know, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, and uh, he, black chicken, you know, he was, he was red and then, he was a spiking temperature and you could see the liver enzymes going off and they get a bit confused. So these are quite suggestive of, of hemophagocytosis. So some of the pearls of care are true hemophagocytosis versus hypotensive, inadequate resuscitation, <clears throat> driving the hyperinflammatory syndromes. Of course, people have used steroids, IVIG, and immunosuppressants in, in, in various contexts with, with various outcomes, right? So the need to normalize parameters often adds to the volume. As you see, with regular dynamic monitoring is very necessary so that we don't jump at every lactate, don't jump at every hematocrit and keep on giving a lot of fluids for patients, right? Many of them actually require a lot of supportive therapy like CBBH, they may require Lasix, NECs, may need intubation, they're all high-risk bleeders. So at any one point, if there's a drastic drop with hematocrit with a very high lactate, give blood, but don't give continuous blood transfusion. It'll actually lead to more damage than good, right? Watch out for vasculitic bleeds, antibiotics for bacterial translocation, and think about empiric antifungals whenever necessary, okay? And targeted transfusion, as we talked about, and of course, shifting to acute liver failure protocols. Some of the important points in acute liver failure protocols is actually to <coughs> establish a good, adequate volume repletion, uh, early intubation, all right? And empiric antifungals, if necessary, and of course, antibiotics, regular surveillance cultures, and uh, correct all the electrolytes, uh, NEC, and keep sodium, uh, 140 and above. This is to avoid cerebral edema and uh, and um, and uh, and of course manage the HLH with any of the uh, available therapies. Like most most common will be steroids, right? And uh, subs, uh, don't forget, not all HLH requires us to 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 do something about it, right? Platelet starts increasing, appetite improves, 
and ASD may peak, but INA starts spontaneously improving. These patients may not need any aggressive treatment, right? So I want to finish off by saying no one is an expert. Don't forget the basics. Improve the recognition of compensated shock, sorry. <clears throat> Don't act on just one parameter. Everything is a therapeutic trial. And of course, these two guidelines are super in terms of improving our knowledge with that. I thank you.